God truly honored them highly by circumcision, speaking to them above all other nations on earth and entrusting his word to them. And in order to preserve his word among them, he gave them a special country. He performed great wonders through them, ordained kings and government, and lavished profits upon them, who not only apprised them of the best things pertaining to the present, but also promised them the future Messiah, the Savior of the world. It was for his sake that God accorded them all this, bidding them look for his coming, to expect him confidently and without delay. For God did all of this solely for his sake. For his sake Abraham was called, circumcision was instituted, and the people were thus exalted, so that all the world might know from which people, from which country, at which time, yes, from which tribe, family, city, and person he would come lest he be reproached by devils and by men for coming from dark corner or from unknown ancestors. No, his ancestors had to be great patriarchs, excellent kings, and outstanding prophets, who bear witness to him. We have already stated how the Jews, with few exceptions, viewed such promises and prophets. They were never able to tolerate a prophet, and always persecuted God's word and declined to give ear to God. That is the complaint and lament of all the prophets. And as their fathers did, so they do still today, nor will they ever mend their ways. If Isaiah, Jeremiah, or other prophets went about among them today and proclaimed what they proclaimed in their day, or declared that the Jews' present circumcision and hope for the Messiah are futile, they would again have to die at their hands, as happened then. Let him who is endowed with reason to say nothing of Christian understanding, note how arbitrarily they pervert and twist the prophet's books with their confounded glosses in violation of their own conscience, on which we can perhaps say more later. For now, that they can no longer stone or kill the prophets physically or personally, they torment them spiritually, mutilate, strangle, and maltreat their beautiful verses so that the human heart is vexed and pained. For this forces us to see how, because of God's wrath, they are wholly delivered into the devil's hands. In brief, they are a prophet-murdering people. Since they can no longer murder the living prophets, they must murder and torment the ones that are dead. Subsequently, after they have scourged, crucified, spat upon, blasphemed, and cursed God in his word, as Isaiah 8 prophesies, they pretentiously trot out their circumcision and other vain, blasphemous, invented, and meaningless works. They presume to be God's only people, to condemn all the world, and they expect that their arrogance and boasting will please God, that he should repay them with a Messiah of their own choosing and prescription. Therefore, dear Christian, be on your guard against such accursed, incorrigible people, from whom you can learn no more than to give God and his word the lie, to blaspheme, to pervert, to murder prophets, and haughtily and proudly to despise all people on earth. Even if God would be willing to disregard all their other sins, which of course is impossible, he could not condone such ineffable, although poor and wretched, pride. For he is called a God of the humble, as Isaiah 66 verse 2 states, But this is the man to whom I will look, he that is humble and contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. I have said enough about the second false boast of the Jews, namely their false and futile circumcision, which did not avail them when they were taken to task by Moses and by Jeremiah because of their uncircumcised hearts. How much less is it useful now when it is nothing more than the devil's trickery with which he mocks and fools them, as he also does the Turks? For wherever God's word is no longer present, circumcision is null and void. In the third place, they are very conceited because God spoke with them and issued them the law of Moses on Mount Sinai. Here we arrive at the right spot. Here God really has to let himself be tortured. Here he must listen as they tire him with their songs and praises because he hallowed them with his holy law set them apart from other nations, and led them out of Egypt. Here we poor Goyim are really despised, and are mere ciphers compared to the holy, chosen, noble, and highly exalted people, which is in possession of God's word, 
They state, as I myself heard, Indeed, what do you have to say to this, that God himself spoke with us on Mount Sinai, and that he did this with no other people? We have nothing with which to refute that, for we cannot deny them this glory. The books of Moses are ready to give proof of it. And David, too, testifies to it, saying in Psalm 147, He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and ordinances to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his ordinances. And in Psalm 103, He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. They relate that the chiefs of the people wore wreaths at Mount Sinai at that time as a symbol that they had contracted a marriage with God through the law, that they had become his bride, that the two had wedded one another. Later we read in all the prophets how God appears and talks with the children of Israel as a husband with his wife. From this also sprang the peculiar worship of Baal, for Baal denotes a man of the house, or a master of the house. Beulah denotes a housewife. The latter also has taken a German form, as when we say, My dear Bule, sweetheart, and I must have a Bule. Formerly, this was an inoffensive term, designating a young lass. It was said that a young man courted, built a young girl with a view to marriage. Now the word has assumed a different connotation. Now we challenge you, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all the prophets, and whoever will, to come and be bold enough to say that such a noble nation with whom God himself converses, and with whom he himself enters into marriage through the, the law, and to whom he joins himself as to a bride, is not God's people. Anyone doing that, I know, would make himself ridiculous and come to grief. In default of any other weapons, they would tear and bite him to pieces, with their teeth, for trying to dispossess them of such glory, praise, and honor. One can neither express nor understand the obstinate, unbridled, incorrigible arrogance of this people, springing from this advantage, that God himself spoke to them. No prophet has ever been able to raise his voice in protest or stand up against them, not even Moses. For in Numbers 16, Korah arose and asserted that they were all holy people of God and asked why Moses alone should rule and teach. Since that time, the majority of them have been genuine Korahites. There have been very few true Israelites, for just as Korah persecuted Moses, they have never subsequently left a prophet alive or unpersecuted, much less have they obeyed him. So it became apparent that they were a defiled bride, yes, an incorrigible whore and an evil slut with whom God ever had to wrangle, scuffle, and fight. If he chastised and struck them with his word through the prophets, they contradicted him, killed his prophets, or, like a mad dog, bit the stick with which they were struck. Thus, Psalm 95 declares, For forty years I loathed that generation, and said, They are a people who err in their heart, and they do not regard my ways. And Moses himself says in Deuteronomy 31, For I know how rebellious and stubborn you are. Behold, while I am yet alive with you, today you have been rebellious against the Lord, how much more after my death? In Isaiah 48, Because I know that you are obstinate, and your neck is an iron sinew, and your forehead is brass, and so on. Anyone who is interested may read more of this. The Jews are well aware that the prophets upbraided the children of Israel from beginning to end as a disobedient, evil people, and as the vilest whore, although they boasted so much of the law of Moses, and of circumcision, and of their ancestry. But it might be objected, surely, this is said about the wicked Jews, not about the pious ones, as they are today. Well and good, for the present I will be content if they confess, as they must confess, that the wicked Jews cannot be God's people, and that their lineage, circumcision, and law of Moses cannot help them. Why, then, do they all, the most wicked as well as the pious, 
boast of circumcision, lineage, and law. The worse a Jew is, the more arrogant he is, solely because he is a Jew, that is, a person descended from Abraham's seed, circumcised, and under the law of Moses. David and other pious Jews were not as conceited as the present day incorrigible Jews. However wicked they may be, they presume to be the noblest lords over against us Gentiles, just by virtue of their lineage and law. Yet the law rebukes them as the vilest whores and rogues under the sun. Furthermore, if they are pious Jews and not the whoring people, as the prophets call them, how does it happen that their piety is so concealed that God himself is not aware of it, and they are not aware of it either? For they have, as we said, prayed, cried, and suffered almost 1,500 years already, and yet God refuses to listen to them. We know from Scripture that God will hear the prayers or sighing of the righteous. As the Psalter says, He fulfills the desire of all who fear Him. He also hears their cry. And Psalm 34, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears. As He promised in Psalm 50, Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you. The same is found in many more verses of the Scripture. If it were not for those who would or could pray. In brief, he says in the first commandment that he will be their God. Then how do you explain that he will not listen to these Jews? They must assuredly be the base, whoring people, that is, no people of God, and their boast of lineage, circumcision, and law must be accounted as filth. If there were a single pious Jew among them who observed these, he would have to be heard. For God cannot let his saints pray in vain as Scripture demonstrates by many examples. This is conclusive evidence that they cannot be pious Jews, but must be the multitude of the whoring and murderous people. Such piety is, as already has been said, so concealed among them that they themselves also can know nothing of it. How, then, shall God know of it? For they are full of malice, greed, envy, hatred toward one another, pride, usury, conceit, and curses against us Gentiles. Therefore a Jew would have to be, have very sharp eyes to recognize a pious Jew, to say nothing of the fact that they all should be God's people as they claim. For they surely hide their piety effectively under their manifest vices, and yet they all, without exception, claim to be Abraham's blood, the people of the circumcision, and of Moses, that is, God's nation, compared with whom the Gentiles must surely be sheer stench. Although they cannot know that God cannot tolerate this, nor did he tolerate it among the angels, yet he should and must listen to their lies and blasphemies, to the effect that they are his people. By virtue of the law he gave them, and because he conversed with their forefathers at Mount Sinai. Why should one make many words about this? If the boast that God spoke with them, and that they possess his word or commandment, were sufficient so that God would on this basis regard them as his people, then the devils in hell would be much worthier of being God's people than the Jews, yes, than any people. For the devils have God's word, and know far better than the Jews that there is a God who created them, whom they are obliged to love with all their heart, to honor, fear, and serve whose name they dare not misuse, whose word they must hear on the Sabbath, and at all times. They know that they are forbidden to murder or to inflict harm on any creature. But what good does it do to them to know and possess God's commandment? Let them boast that this makes them God's own special, dear angels, in comparison with whom other angels are nothing. How much better off they would be if they did not have God's commandment, or if they were ignorant of it. For if they did not have it, they would not be condemned. The very reason for their condemnation is they possess his commandment and yet do not keep it, but violate it constantly. In the same manner, murderers and whores, thieves and rogues, and all evil men might boast that they are God's holy, peculiar people. For they too have his word and know that they must fear and obey him, love and serve him, honor his name, refrain from murder, adultery, theft, 
and every other evil deed. If they did not have God's holy and true word, they could not sin. But since they do sin and are condemned, it is certain that they do have the holy and true word of God against which they sin. Let them boast, like the Jews, that God has sanctified them through his law and chosen them above all other men as a peculiar people. It is the same kind of boasting when the Jews boast in their synagogues, praising and thanking God for sanctifying them through his law and setting them apart as a peculiar people. Although they know full well that they are not at all observing this law, that they are full of conceit, envy, usury, greed, and all sorts of malice. The worst offenders are those who pretend to be very devout and holy in their prayers. They are so blind that they not only practice usury, not to mention the other vices, but they teach that it is a right which God conferred on them through Moses. Thereby, as in all the other matters, they slander God most infamously. However, we lack the time to dwell on that now. But when they declare that even if they are not holy because of the Ten Commandments, since all Gentiles and devils also are duty-bound to keep these, or else are polluted and condemned on account of them, they still have the other laws of Moses, besides the Ten Commandments, which were given exclusively to them and not also to the Gentiles, and by which they are sanctified and singled out from all other nations. O oh Lord God, what a lame, loose, and vain excuse and pretext this is! If the Ten Commandments are not obeyed, what does the keeping of the other laws amount to other than mere jugglery and mummery? Indeed, a veritable mockery which treats God as a fool. It is just as if an evil, devilish fellow among us were to parade about in the garb of a pope, cardinal, bishop, or pastor, and observe all the precepts and the ways of these persons, but underneath these spiritual dresses would be a genuine devil, a wolf, an enemy of the church, a blasphemer who trampled both the gospel and the Ten Commandments underfoot and cursed and damned them. What a fine saint he would be in God's sight! Or let us suppose that somewhere a pretty girl came along, adorned with a wreath, and observed all the manners, the duties, the deportment, and discipline of a chaste virgin. But underneath was a vile, shameful whore, violating the Ten Commandments. What good would her fine obedience in observing outwardly all the duties and customs of a virgin station do for her? It would help her this much, that one would be seven times more hostile to her than to an impudent public whore. Thus God constantly chided the children of Israel through the prophets, calling them a vile whore, because under the guise and decor of external laws and sanctity, they practiced all sorts of idolatry and villainy, as especially Hosea laments in chapter 2. To be sure, it is commendable when a pious virgin or woman is decently and cleanly dressed and adorned and outwardly conducts herself with modesty. But if she is a whore, her garments, adornments, wreaths, and jewels would better befit a sow that wallows in the mire. As Solomon says, like a gold ring in a swine's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. That is to say, she is a whore. Therefore, this boast about the external laws of Moses, apart from obedience to the Ten Commandments, should be silenced. Indeed, this boast makes the Jews seven times more unworthy to be God's people than the Gentiles are. For the external laws were not given to make a nation the people of God, but to adorn and enhance God's people externally, just as the Ten Commandments were not given that any might boast of them and haughtily despise all the world because of them, as if they were holy and God's people because of them. Rather, they were given to be observed, and that obedience to God might be shown in them, as Moses and all the prophets most earnestly teach. Not he who has them shall glory, as we saw in the instance of the devils and of evil men, but he who keeps them. He who has them and fails to keep them must be ashamed and terrified, because he will surely be condemned by them. But this subject is beyond the ken of the blind and hardened Jews. 
Speaking to them about it is much the same as preaching the gospel to a sow. They cannot know what God's commandment really is, much less do they know how to keep it. After all, they could not listen to Moses, nor look into his face. He had to cover it with a veil. This veil is there to the present day, and they still do not behold Moses' face, that is, his doctrine. It is still veiled to them. Thus they could not hear God's word on Mount Sinai when he talked to them. But they retreated, saying to Moses, You speak to us, and we will hear. But let not God speak to us, lest we die. To know God's commandment, and to know how to keep it, requires a high prophetic understanding. Moses was well aware of that when he said in Exodus 34 that God forgives sin, and that no one is guiltless before him, which is to say that no one keeps his commandments, but he who sins God forgives. As David also testifies in Psalm 32, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity. And in the same psalm, Therefore let everyone who is godly offer prayer to thee for forgiveness. Which means that no saint keeps God's commandments. But if the saints fail to keep them, how will the ungodly, the unbelievers, the evil people keep them? Again we read in Psalm 143, O Lord, enter not into judgment with thy servant, for no man living is righteous before thee. That attests clearly enough that even the holy servants of God are not justified before him unless he sets aside his judgment and deals with them in his mercy. That is, they do not keep his commandments and stand in need of forgiveness of sins. This calls for a man who will assist us in this, who bears our sin for us. As Isaiah 53 says, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Indeed, that is truly to understand God's law and its observance, when we know, recognize, yes, and feel that we have it, but do not keep it and cannot keep it, that in view of this we are poor sinners and guilty before God, and that it is only out of pure grace and mercy that we receive forgiveness for such guilt and disobedience through the man on whom God has laid this sin. Of this we Christians speak, and this we teach, and of this the prophets and apostles speak to us and teach us. They are the ones who were, and still are, our God's bride and pure virgin. And yet they boast of no law or holiness, as the Jews do, in their synagogues. They rather wail over the law and cry for mercy and forgiveness of sins. The Jews, on the other hand, are as holy as the barefoot friars, who possess so much excess holiness that they can use it to help others to get to heaven and still retain a rich and abundant supply to sell. It is of no use to speak to any of them about these matters, for their blindness and arrogance are as solid as an iron mountain. They are in the right. God is in the wrong. Let them go their way, and let us remain with those who pray the miserere, Psalm 51, that is, with those who know and understand what the law is and what it means to keep and not to keep it. Learn from this, dear Christian, what you are doing if you permit the blind Jews to mislead you. Then the saying will truly apply. When a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into the pit. You cannot learn anything from them except how to misunderstand the divine commandments. And despite this, boast haughtily over against the Gentiles, who really are much better before God than they, since they do not have such pride of holiness, and yet keep far more of the law than these arrogant saints and damned blasphemers and liars. Therefore be on your guard against the Jews, knowing that wherever they have their synagogues, nothing is found but a den of devils, in which sheer self-glory, conceit, lies, blasphemy, and defaming of God and men are practiced most maliciously and vehemently, just as the devils themselves do. And where you see or hear a Jew teaching, remember that you are hearing nothing but a venomous basilisk who poisons and kills people merely by fastening his eyes on them. God's wrath has consigned them 
to the presumption that their boasting, their conceit, their slander of God, their cursing of all people, are a true and great service rendered to God, all of which is very fitting and becoming to such noble blood of the fathers and circumcised saints. This they believe, despite the fact that they know they are steeped in manifest vices. And with all this, they claim to be doing right. Be on your guard against them. In the fourth place, they pride themselves tremendously on having received the land of Canaan, the city of Jerusalem, and the temple from God. God has often squashed such boasting and arrogance, especially through the king of Babylon, who led them away into captivity and destroyed everything, just as the king of Assyria earlier had led all of Israel away and had laid everything low. Finally, they were exterminated and devastated by the Romans over 1,400 years ago, so that they might well perceive that God did not regard, nor will regard, their country, city, temple, priesthood, or principality, and view them on account of these as his own peculiar people. Yet their iron neck, as Isaiah calls it, is not bent, nor is their brass forehead red with shame. They remain stone blind, obdurate, immovable, ever hoping that God will restore their homeland to them and give everything back to them. Moses had informed them a great many times, first, that they were not occupying the land because their righteousness exceeded that of other heathen, for they were a stubborn, evil, disobedient people, and second, that they would soon be expelled from the land and perish if they did not keep God's commandments. And when God chose the city of Jerusalem, he added very clearly in the writings of all the prophets that he would utterly destroy the city of Jerusalem, his seat and throne, if they would not keep his commandments. Furthermore, when Solomon had built the temple, had sacrificed and prayed to God, God said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplications. I have consecrated this house, etc. But then he added shortly thereafter, But if you turn aside from following me, and do not keep my commandments, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them, and the house which I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight. And Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all peoples. With an utter disregard for this, they stood and still stand, firm as a rock, or as an inert stone image, insisting that God gave them country, city, and temple, and that therefore they have to be God's people or church. They neither hear nor see that God gave them all of this that they might keep his commandments, that is, regard him as their God, and thus be his people and church. They boast of their race and of their descent from the fathers, but they neither see nor pay attention to the fact that he chose their race, that they should keep his commandments. They boast of their circumcision, but why... They are circumcised, namely, that they should keep God's commandments, counts for naught. They are quick to boast of their law, temple, worship, city, land, and government. But why they possess all of this, they disregard. The devil, with all his angels, has taken possession of this people, so that they always exalt external things, their gifts, their deeds, their works, before God which is tantamount to offering God the empty shells without the kernels. These they expect God to esteem, and by reason of them accept them as his people, and exalt and bless them above all Gentiles, but that he wants his laws observed, and wants to be honored by them as God, this they do not want to consider. Thus the words of Moses are fulfilled when he says that God will not regard them as his people, since they do not regard him as their God. Hosea, too, expresses the same thought. Indeed, if God had not allowed the city of Jerusalem to be destroyed and had them driven out of their country, but had permitted them to remain there, no one could have convinced them that they are not God's people, since they would still be in possession of temple, city, and country, regardless of how base, disobedient, and stubborn they were. They would not have believed it, even if it had 
snowed nothing but prophets daily. And even if a thousand Moseses had stood up and shouted, You are not God's people, because you are disobedient and rebellious to God. Why, even today, they cannot refrain from their nonsensical, insane boasting that they are God's people, although they have been cast out, dispersed, and utterly rejected for almost 1,500 years. By virtue of their own merits, they still hope to return there again, but they have no such promise with which they could console themselves other than what their false imagination smuggles into Scripture. Our Apostle St. Paul was right when he said of them that they have a zeal for God, but it is not enlightened. They claim to be God's people by reason of their deeds, works, and external show, and not because of sheer grace and mercy, as all prophets and all true children of God have to be, as was said. Therefore, they are beyond counsel and help, in the same way as our papists, bishops, monks, and priests, together with their following, who insist that they are God's people and church. They believe that God should esteem them because they are baptized, because they have the name, and because they rule the roost. There they stand like a rock. If a hundred thousand apostles came alongside and said, You are not the church because of your behavior, or your many doings, and divine services, even though these were your best efforts, no, you must despair of all this, and adhere simply and solely to the grace and mercy of Christ, etc. If you fail to do this, you are the devil's whore, or a school of knaves, and not the church. They would wish to murder, burn at the stake, or banish such apostles. As for believing them and abandoning their own devices, of this there is no hope. It will not happen. The Turks follow the same pattern with their worship, as do all fanatics. Jews, Turks, Papists, radicals abound everywhere. All of them claim to be the Church and God's people in accord with their conceit and boast, regardless of the one true faith and the obedience to God's commandments, through which alone people become and remain God's children. Even if they do not all pursue the same course, but one chooses this way, another that way, resulting in a variety of forms, they nonetheless all have the same intent and ultimate goal, namely, by means of their own deeds, they want to manage and become God's people. And thus, they boast and brag that they are the ones whom God will esteem. They are the foxes of Samson, which are tied together tail to tail, but whose heads turn away in different directions. But as we noted earlier, that is beyond the comprehension of the Jews, as well as the Turks and Papists. As St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, The unspiritual man does not receive the gifts of the Spirit of God, because they are spiritually discerned. Thus the words of Isaiah 6 come true. Hear and hear, but do not understand. See and see, but do not perceive. For they do not know what they hear, see, say, or do. And yet they do not concede that they are blind and deaf. That shall be enough about the false boast and pride of the Jews, who would move God with their sheer lies to regard them as his people. Now we come to the main subject. They're asking God for the Messiah. Here at last, they show themselves as true saints and pious children. At this point, they certainly do not want to be accounted liars and blasphemers, but reliable prophets asserting that the Messiah has not yet come, but will still appear. Who will take them to task here for their error or mistake? Even if all the angels and God himself publicly declared on Mount Sinai or in the temple in Jerusalem that the Messiah had come long ago and that he was no longer to be expected, God himself and all the angels would have to be considered nothing but devils. So convinced are these most holy and truthful prophets that the Messiah has not yet appeared but will still come nor will they listen to us. They turned a deaf ear to us in the past, and still do so, although many fine scholarly people, including some from their own race, have refuted them so thoroughly that even stone and wood, if endowed with a particle of reason, would have to yield. 
yet they rave consciously against recognized truth. Their accursed rabbis, who indeed know better, wantonly poison the minds of their poor youth and of the common man, and divert them from the truth. For I believe that if the, these writings were read by the common man and the youth, they would stone all their rabbis and hate them more violently than they do us Christians. But these villains prevent our sincere views from coming to their attention. If I had not had the experience with my papists, it would have seemed incredible to me that the earth should harbor such base people who knowingly fly in the face of open and manifest truth, that is, of God himself. For I never expected to encounter such hardened minds in any human breast, but only in that of the devil. However, I am no longer amazed by either the Turks or the Jews' blindness, obduracy, and malice, since I have to witness the same thing in the most holy fathers of the church, in pope, cardinals, and bishops. Oh, you terrible wrath and incomprehensible judgment of the sublime divine majesty! How can you be so despised by the children of men that we do not forthwith tremble to death before you? What an unbearable sight you are! Also, to the hearts and eyes of the holiest men, as we see in Moses and the prophets. Yet these stony hearts and iron souls mock you so defiantly. However, although we perhaps labor in vain on the Jews, for I said earlier that I don't want to dispute with them, we nonetheless want to discuss their senseless folly among ourselves for the strengthening of our faith and as a warning to weak Christians against the Jews, and chiefly in honor of God in order to prove that our faith is true and that they are entirely mistaken on the question of the Messiah. We Christians have our New Testament, which furnishes us reliable and adequate testimony concerning the Messiah. That the Jews do not believe it does not concern us. We believe their accursed glosses still less. We let them go their way and wait for their Messiah. Their unbelief does not harm us, but as to the help they derive and to date have derived from it, they may ask of their long-enduring exile. That will, indeed, supply the answer for us. Let him who will not follow lag behind. They act as though they were of great importance to us. Just to vex us, they corrupt the sayings of Scripture. We do not at all desire or require their conversion for any advantage, usefulness, or help accruing to us therefrom. All that we do in this regard is prompted rather by a concern for their welfare. If they do not want it, they can disregard it. We are excused and can easily dispense with them, together with all that they are, have, and can do for salvation. We have a better knowledge of Scripture. Thanks be to God. This we are certain of, and all the devils shall never deprive us of it, much less the miserable Jews. First, we want to submit the verse found in Genesis 49. The scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. This saying of the holy patriarch Jacob, spoken at the very end of his life, has been tortured and crucified in many ways down to the present day by the modern, strange Jews in violation of their own conscience. For they realize fully that their twisting and perverting it is nothing but wanton mischief. Their glosses remind me very much of an evil, stubborn shrew who clamorously contradicts her husband and insists on having the last word, although she knows she is in the wrong. Thus, these blinded people also suppose that it suffices to bark and to prattle against the text and its true meaning. They are entirely indifferent to the fact that they are lying impudently. I believe they would be happier if this verse had never been written, rather than that they should change their mind. This verse pains them intensely, and they cannot ignore it. The ancient, true Jews understood this verse correctly, as we Christians do, namely, that the government, or scepter, should remain with the tribe of Judah until the advent of the Messiah. Then, to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. 
to him they will adhere. That is, the scepter shall then not be confined to the tribe of Judah, but, as the prophets later explain, it shall be extended to all peoples on earth at the time of the Messiah. However, until he appears, the scepter shall remain in that small nook and corner, Judah. That, I say, is the understanding of the prophets and of the ancient Jews. This they cannot deny. For also their Chaldean Bible, which they dare oppose as little as the Hebrew Bible itself, shows this clearly. In translation it reads thus, The Shultan shall not be put away from the house of Judah, nor the Safra from his children's children eternally until the Messiah comes whose is the kingdom, and the peoples will make themselves obedient to him. This is a true and faithful translation of the Chaldean text, as no Jew or devil can deny. For Moses' Hebrew term, Shebet, scepter, we use the word Zepter in German, whereas the Chaldean translator chooses the word Shultan. Let us explain these words. The Hebrew, Shebet, is the designation for a verga. It is really not a rod in the usual sense, for this term suggests that to the German the thought of birch switches with which children are punished. Nor is it a staff used by invalids and the aged for walking, but it designates a mace held upright, such as a judge holds in his hand when he acts in his official capacity. As luxury increased in the world, this mace was made of silver or of gold. Now it is called a scepter, that is a royal rod. Skeptron is a Greek word, but it has now been taken up into the German language. In his first book, Homer describes his king Achilles as having a wooden scepter adorned with a small silver nails. From this we learn what scepters originally were and how they gradually came to be made entirely of silver and gold. In brief, it is the rod, whether of silver, wood, or gold, carried by a king or his representative. It symbolizes nothing other than dominion or kingdom. Nobody questions this. To make it very clear, the Chaldean translator does not use the word shebet, mace, or scepter, but he substitutes the person who bears this rod, saying shultan, indicating that a prince, lord, or king shall not depart from the house of Judah. There shall be a sultan in the house of Judah until the Messiah comes. Sultan is also a Hebrew term, and a word well known to the, us Christians who have waged war for more than 600 years against the sultan of Egypt and have gained very little to show for it. For the Saracens call their king or prince sultan, that is, lord, or ruler, or sovereign. From this the Hebrew word schild is de derived, which has become a thoroughly German word schild, or shield. It is as though one wished to say that a prince or lord might or must be his subject's shield, protection, and defense, if he is to be a true judge, sultan, or lord, etc. Some people even tried to trace the German term schotteis, village mayor, back to the word sultan. I shall not enter into this. Safra is the same as the Hebrew sofer, for Chaldee and Hebrew are closely related. Indeed, they are almost identical, just as Saxons and Swabians both speak German, but still there is a great difference. The word sofer we commonly translate into the German by means of kanzler, or chancellor. Everyone including Burgensis, translates the word safra with scriba, or scribe. These people are called scribes in the gospel. They are not ordinary scribes who write for wages or without official authority. They are sages, great rulers, doctors, and professors who teach, order, and preserve the law in the state. I suppose that it also encompasses the chancellors, parliaments, counselors, and all who by wisdom and justice aid in governing. That is what Moses wishes to express with the word mehokek, which designates one who teaches, 
composes, and executes commands and decrees. Among the Saracens, for, for instance, the Sultan's scribes or secretaries, his doctors, teachers, and scholars, are those who teach, interpret, and preserve the Koran as the law of the land. In the papacy, the Pope's scribes or safra are the canonists or jackasses who teach and preserve his decretals and laws. In the empire, the doctoris legum, the secular jurists, are the emperor's safra or scribes who teach, administer, and preserve the imperial laws. Thus Judah, too, had scribes who taught and preserved the law of Moses, which was the law of the land. Therefore we have translated the word mehokek with master, that is, doctor, teacher, etc. So this passage, the mehokek, i.e. master, will not be taken from between his feet, means that teachers and listeners who sit at their feet will remain in an orderly government. For every country, if it is to endure, must have these two things, power and law. The country, as the saying goes, must have a lord, a head, a ruler, but it must also have a law by which the ruler is guided. These are the mace and the mehokek, or sultan and safra. Solomon indicates this also, for when he had received the rod, that is the kingdom, he prayed only for wisdom, so that he might rule the people justly. 1 Kings 3. For wherever sheer power prevails without the law, where the sultan is guided by his arbitrary will and not by duty, there is no government but tyranny, akin to that of Nero, Caligula, Dionysius, Henry of Brunswick, and their like. Such does not endure long. On the other hand, where there is law but no power to enforce it, where the wild mob will also do its will, and no government there can survive. Therefore both must be present, law and power, sultan and safra, to supplement one another. Thus, the counselors who gathered in Jerusalem, and who were to come from the tribe of Judah, were the safra. The Jews called them the Sanhedrin. Herod, a foreigner, an Edomite, did away with this, and he himself became both sultan and safra, mace and mehokek, in the house of Judah, lord and scribe. Thus the saying of the patriarch began to be fulfilled, that Judah was no longer to retain the government or the safra. Now it was time for the Messiah to come and to occupy his kingdom and sit on the throne of David forever, as Isaiah 9 prophesies. Therefore let us now study this saying of the patriarch. Judah, he declares, your brothers shall praise you, etc. Genesis 49. This, it seems to me, requires no commentary. It states clearly enough that the tribe of Judah will be honored above all his brothers and will enjoy the prerogative. The text continues, your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies, etc. This also declares plainly that the famous and prominent tribe of Judah must encounter enemies and opposition, but that all will end successfully and victoriously for it. We continue. Your father's sons shall bow down before you, etc. Again, it is clear that this does not refer to the captivity, but to the rule over his brothers, all of which was fulfilled in David. But not only did the tribe of Judah in David become lord over his brothers, he also spread his rule beyond, like a lion, forcing other nations into submission. For instance, the Philistines, the Syrians, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites. This is what he praises in these beautiful words. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares to rise up against him. This is to say that he was enthroned and established, a kingdom which no one could overwhelm, though the adjacent nations frequently and mightily tried to do so. All right, up to this point, the patriarch has established, ordained, and confirmed the kingdom, the sultan, the rod, the safra, in the tribe of Judah. There Judah, the sultan, sits enthroned for his rule. What is to happen now? This, he says, 
He shall remain thus until the Messiah comes. That is, many will oppose him, attempting to overthrow and destroy the kingdom and simply make it disappear from the earth. The histories of the kings and the prophets amply testify that all the Gentile nations ever earnestly strove to do this. And the patriarch himself declares, as we heard before, that Judah must have its foes. For such is the course of events in the world that wherever a kingdom or principality rises to a position of might, envy will not rest until it is destroyed. All of history illustrates this with numerous examples. However, in this instance, the Holy Spirit states, The kingdom in the tribe of Judah is mine, and no one shall take it from me, no matter how angry and mighty he may be, even if the gates of hell should try. The words still prove true. Non afferitur. It shall not be taken away. You devils and Gentiles may say, Afferitur. We shall put an end to it. We shall devour it. We shall silence it. As Psalm 74 bemoans, but it shall remain undevoured, undevastated. The Shebet, or Sultan, shall not depart from the house of Judah, nor the Safra from his children's children, until the Shiloh, or Messiah, comes, no matter how you all rant and rage. And when he does appear, the kingdom will become far different and still more glorious. For since you would not tolerate the tribe of Judah in a little, narrow corner, I shall change him into a truly strong lion, who will become Sultan and Safra in all the world. I will do this by such a way that he will not draw a sword nor shed a drop of blood, but the nations will voluntarily and gladly submit themselves to him and obey him. Such shall be his kingdom, for after all, the kingdom and all things are his. Approach the text, both the Chaldean and Hebrew, with this understanding and this thought, and I wager your heart, together with the letters, will, will surely tell you, by God, that is the truth, that is the patriarch's meaning. And then consult the histories to ascertain whether or not this has happened, and come to pass in this way, and still continues to do so. Again, you will be compelled to say, it is verily so. For it is undeniable that the Sultan and Safra remained with the tribe of Judah until Herod's time, even if it was at times feeble and was not maintained without the opposition of at times mighty foes. Nevertheless, it was preserved under Herod, and after Herod, however, it fell into ruin and came to an end. It was so completely destroyed that even Jerusalem, once the throne seat of the tribe of Judah, and the land of Canaan were wiped out. Thus, the verse was fulfilled, which said that the Sultan has departed, and the Messiah has come. I do not have the time at present to demonstrate what a rich fountainhead this verse is, and how the prophets drew so much information from it concerning the fall of the Jews and the election of the Gentiles, about which the modern Jews and bastards know nothing at all. But we have clearly and forcefully seen from this verse that the Messiah had to come at the time of Herod. The alternative would be to say that God failed to keep his promise and consequently lied. No one dare do that save the accursed devil and his servants, the false bastards and strange Jews. They do this incessantly. In their eyes, God must be a liar. They claim that they are right when they assert that the Messiah has not yet come, despite the fact that God declared in very plain words that the Messiah would come before the scepter had entirely departed from Judah. And this scepter has been lost to Judah for almost 1,500 years now. The clear words of God vouch for this, and so do the visible effect and fulfillment of these same words. What do you hope to accomplish by engaging an obstinate Jew in a long dispute on this? It is just as though you were to talk to an insane person and prove to him that God created heaven and earth, according to Genesis 1, pointing out heaven and earth to him with your hands. And he would nevertheless prattle that these are not the heaven and earth mentioned in Genesis 1, or that they were not heaven and earth at all, but were called something else, etc. For this verse, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, etc., is as clear and plain as the verse, God created heaven and earth.
And the fact that this scepter has been removed from Judah for almost 1,500 years is as patent and manifest as heaven and earth are, so that one can readily perceive that the Jews are not simply erring and misled, but that they are maliciously and willfully denying and blaspheming the recognized truth in violation of their conscience. Nobody should consider such a person worthy of wasting a single word on him, even if dealt with uh, Markov the Mockingbird, much less if it deals with such exalted divine words and works. But if anyone is tempted to become displeased with me, I will serve his purpose and give him the Jew's glosses on this text. First, I will present those who do not dismiss the text but adhere to it, particularly to the Chaldean version which no sensible Jew can deny. These twist and turn as follows. To be sure, they say, God's promise is certain, but our sins prevented the fulfillment of the promise. Therefore, we look forward to it still until we have atoned, etc. Is this not an empty pretext, even a blasphemous one? As if God's promise rested on our righteousness or fell with our sins. That is tantamount to saying that God would have to become a liar, because of our sin, and conversely, that he would have to become truthful again by reason of our righteousness. How could one speak more shamefully of God than to imply that he is a shaking reed which is easily swayed back and forth, either by our falling down or standing up? If God were not to make a promise or keep a promise until we were rid of sin, he would have been unable to promise or do anything from the very beginning. As David says in Psalm 130, if thou, O Lord, shouldst mark iniquity, Lord, who could stand? And in Psalm 102, Enter not into judgment with thy servant, for no man living is righteous before thee. And there are many more such verses. The example of the children of Israel in the wilderness can be cited here. God led them into the land of Canaan without any righteousness on their part, in fact, with their great sins and shame, solely on account of his promise. In Deuteronomy 9, Moses says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness. For you are a stubborn and disobedient people. It seems to me that this may indeed be called sin, but because of the promise which the Lord gave to your fathers, etc. By way of example, he often wanted to exterminate them, but Moses interceded for them. So little was God's promise based upon their holiness. It is true that wherever God promises anything conditionally, or with reservation, saying, If you will do that, I will do this, then the fulfillment is contingent on our action. For instance, when he declares to Solomon, 1 Kings 9, If you will keep my statutes and my ordinances, then this house shall be consecrated to me. If not... I shall destroy it. However, the promise of the Messiah is not thus conditional, for he does not say, if you will do this or that, then the Messiah will come. If you fail to do it, he will not come. But he promises him unconditionally, saying, the Messiah will come at the time when the scepter has departed from Judah. Such a promise is based only on divine truth and grace, which ignores and disregards our doings. That renders the subterfuge of the Jews inane, and moreover, very blasphemous. The others who depart from this text subject almost every single word of it to severe and violent misinterpretation. They really do not deserve to have their drivel and filth heard. Still, in order to expose their disgrace, we must exercise a bit of patience and also listen to their nonsense. For since they depart from the clear meaning of the text, they already stand condemned by their own conscience, which would constrain them to heed the text. But to vex us, they conjure up the Hebrew words before our eyes, as though we were not conversant with the Chaldean text. Some engage in fantasies here, and say that Shiloh refers to the city of that name, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, Judges 21, so that the meaning could be that the scepter shall not depart from Sh Judah until Shiloh comes, that is, until Saul is anointed king of Shiloh. That is surely foolish prattle. Prior to King Saul, not only did Judah have no scepter, 
but neither did all of Israel. How then can it have departed when Saul becomes king? The text declares that Judah had first been lord over his brothers, and that he then became a lion, and therefore received the scepter. Likewise, before Saul's time, no judge was lord or prince over the people of Israel, as we gather from Gideon's speech to the people, in reply to their wish that he and his descendants rule over them. I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Judges 7 Nor was there a judge from the tribe of Judah, except perhaps for Othniel. Joshua's immediate successor. All the others down to Saul were from the other tribes. And although Othniel is called Caleb's youngest brother, this does not prove that he was of the tribe of Judah, since he may have had a different father. And it does not make sense that Shiloh should here refer to a city or to Saul's coronation in Shiloh, for Saul was anointed by Samuel in Ramath, 1 Samuel 10, and confirmed at Gilgal. In any case, what is the meaning of the Chaldean text, which says that the kingdom belongs to Shiloh, and that the nations shall be subject to it? When was the city of Shiloh, or Saul, ever accorded such an honor? Israel is one nation, not many, with one body of laws, one divine worship, one name. There are many nations, however, which have different and various laws, names, and gods. Now, Jacob declares that not the one nation Israel, which was already his, or was under Judah's scepter, but other nations would fall to Shiloh. Therefore, this foolish talk affects nothing other than the great stubbornness of the Jews, who will not submit to the saying of Jacob, although they stand convicted by their own conscience. Others indulge in the fancy that Shiloh refers to King Jeroboam, who was crowned in Shiloh, and to whom the ten tribes of Israel had defected from Rehoboam, the king of Judah. Therefore they say this is Jacob's meaning. The scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh, that is Jeroboam, comes. This is just as inane as the other interpretation, for Jeroboam was not crowned in Shiloh, but in Shechem, 1 Kings 12. Thus the scepter did not depart from Judah, but the kingdom of Judah remained, together with the tribe of Benjamin, and many of the children of Israel who dwelt in the cities of these two tribes, as we hear in 1 Kings 12. Moreover, the entire priesthood, worship, temple, and everything remained in Judah. Furthermore, Jeroboam never conquered the kingdoms of Judah, nor did other nations fall to him, as they were to fall to Shiloh. The third group babbles thus, Shiloh means sent, and this term applies to Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. So the meaning is that the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh, that is, the king of Babylon, comes. He was to lead Judah into exile and destroy it. This also doesn't hold water, and a child learning his letters, can disprove it. For Shiloh and Shiloh are two different words. The latter may mean sent, but that is not the word found here. It is Shiloh, and that, as the Chaldee says, means Messiah. But the king of Babylon is not the Messiah who is to come from Judah, as the Jews in all the world know very well. Nor did the scepter depart from Judah, even though the Jews were led captive into Babylon. That was just a punishment for seventy years. Also, during this time, great prophets, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, appeared who upheld the scepter and said how long the exile would be. Furthermore, Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, was regarded as a king in Babylon. And many of those who were led away into captivity returned home again during their lifetime, Haggai 2. This cannot be viewed as a loss of the scepter, but as a light flogging. Even if they were deprived of their country for a while by way of punishment, God nonetheless pledged his precious word that they could remain assured of their land. But during the past 1,500 years, not even a dog, much less a prophet, has any assurance concerning the land. Therefore the scepter has now definitively departed from Judah. I have written more about this against the Sabbatarians. The fourth group twists the word Shabet and interprets it to mean that the rod 
will not depart from Judah until Shiloh, that is, his son, will come who will weaken the Gentiles. These regard the rod as the punishment and exile in which they now live. But the Messiah will come and slay all the Gentiles. That is humbug. It ignores the Chaldean text entirely, something they may and dare not do, and is a complete arbitrary interpretation of the word Shabbat. They overlook the preceding words in which Jacob makes Judah a prince and a lion or a king, adding immediately thereafter that the scepter or Shabbat shall not depart from Judah. How could such an odd meaning about punishment follow right on the heels of such glorious words about a principality or kingdom? The sins which provoked such a punishment would have to have been proclaimed first. But all that we find mentioned here are praise, honor, and glory to the tribe of Judah. And even if the word Shabbat does designate a rod for punishment, how would that help them? For the judge's or the king's rod is also a rod of punishment for the evildoers. Indeed, the rod of punishment cannot be any but a judge's or sultan's rod, since the right to administer punishment belongs solely to the authority. Deuteronomy 32. Mihi vindicatum. Vengeance is mine. In any event, this meaning remains unshaken, that the scepter or rod of Judah shall remain, even if the rod is a one of punishment. But this arbitrary interpretation of the rabbis points to a foreign rod which does not rest in Judah's hand, but on Judah's back, and is wielded by a foreign land, even if this meaning were possible, which it is not. What would we do with the other passage that speaks of the Safra, or Mehokek, at his feet? This would then also have to be a foreign lord's Mehokek, and a foreign nation's feet. But since Jacob declares that it is to be Judah and the Mehokek of his feet, the other term, the rod, must also represent the rule of his tribe. Some twist the word Donek, until, and try to make because, qui, ah, out of it. So they read, the scepter of Judah will not depart, Donek, that is because, qui, ah, the Messiah will come. He who perpetrated this is a precious master, worthy of being crowned with thistles. He reverses the correct order of things in this manner. The Messiah will come, therefore the scepter will remain. Jacob, however, first makes Judah a prince and a lion, to whom the scepter is assigned prior to the coming of Messiah. He then, in turn, will give it to Messiah. Thus, Judah retains neither the principality, nor the role of lion, nor the scepter, which Jacob assigned to him. Furthermore, the fool arbitrarily makes out of the term until a new term because. This, of course, the language does not permit. And finally, there is a rabbi who twists the word come and claims that it means to set, just as the Hebrew uses the word to come for the setting of the sun. This fellow is given to such nonsense that I am at a loss to know whether he is trying to walk on his head or on his ears. For I fail to understand the purport of his words when he says that the scepter will not depart from Judah until Shiloh, the city, goes down, sets. Then David, the Messiah, will come. Where, to repeat what was said above, was the scepter of Judah prior to Shiloh or Saul? But they who rage against their own conscience and patent truth must needs speak such nonsense. In brief, Lyra is right when he says that even if they invent these and many other similar glosses, the Chaldean text topples all of them and convicts them of being willful liars, blasphemers, and perverters of God's word. However, I wanted to present this to us Germans so that we might see what rascals the blind Jews are and how powerfully the truth of God in our midst stands with us and against them. And now that some have noticed that such evasions and silly glosses are null and void, they admit that the Messiah came at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. But they say he is in the world secretly, sitting in Rome among the beggars, and doing penance for the Jews until the time for his public appearance is at hand. 
These are not the words of Jews or of men, but those of the arrogant, jeering devil, who most bitterly and venomously mocks us Christians and our Christ through the Jews, as if to say, The Christians glory much in their Christ, but they have to submit to the yoke of the Romans. They must suffer and be beggars in the world, not only in the days of the emperors, but also in these of the Pope. After all, they are impotent in my kingdom, the world, and I will surely remain their master. Yes, vile devil, just mock and laugh your fill over this now. You will still tremble enough for it. Thus the words of Jacob fared very much the same as did these words of Christ in our day. This is my body, which is given for you. The enthusiasts distorted each word singly and collectively, putting last things first, rather than accept the true meaning of the text, as we have observed. It is clear in this instance, too, that Christians, such as Lyra, Raymond, Burgenses, and others, certainly went to great lengths in an effort to convert the Jews. They hounded them from one word to another, just as foxes are hunted down. But after having been hounded a long time, they still persisted in their obstinacy, and now set to erring consciously, and would not depart from their rabbis. Thus we must let them go their way, and ignore the malicious blasphemy and lying. I once experienced this myself. Three learned Jews came to me, hoping to discover a new Jew in me, because we were beginning to read Hebrew here in Wittenberg, and remarking that matters would soon improve since we Christians were starting to read their books. When I debated with them, they gave me their glosses, as they usually do. But when I forced them back to the text, they soon fled from it, saying that they were obliged to believe their rabbis, as we do the Pope and the doctors, etc. I took pity on them, and gave them a letter of recommendation to the authorities, asking that for Christ's sake they let them go freely along their way. But later I found out that they called Christ a tola, that is, a hanged highwayman. Therefore I do not wish to have anything more to do with any Jew. As St. Paul says, they are consigned to wrath. The more one tries to help them, the baser and more stubborn they become. Leave them to their own devices. We Christians, however, can greatly strengthen our faith with this statement of Jacob, assuring us that Christ is now present and that he has been present for almost 1,500 years, but not, as the devil jeers, as a beggar in Rome, rather as a ruling Messiah. If this were not so, then God's word and promise would be a lie. If the Jews would only let Holy Scripture be God's word, they would also have to submit that there has been a Messiah since the time of Herod, no matter where, rather than awaiting another. But before doing this, they will rather tear and pervert Scripture until it is no longer Scripture. And this is in fact their situation. They have neither Messiah nor Scripture, just as Isaiah 28 prophesied of them.